Welcome everyone. This is um, our fifth week of uh, distance learning. So uh, for today, we're actually going to um, start the new topic. We're going to begin with uh, probability, right? Um, so last, this last few weeks, we've actually um, gone over um, counting the uh, process becoming more complicated as we progress eventually we reach our main goal probability so as we actually go pa as we go move forward with probability you will notice that computing probability is actually um, more difficult but it definitely requires knowledge of being able to count so we will begin or we will start the few top the few weeks with um probability with counting and then eventually progressing to harder probability concepts Okay, but before we actually begin with our um, lesson for the week, let us, of course, um, go over the guidelines. Aha! Right, so um, this is our um, distance learning safety guidelines. I hope that you are actually very familiar with this already. So um, please be reminded that the PGCPS administrative procedures regarding appropriate use of technology, social media, and email continue to apply to our online instruction. In addition, this session may not be recorded without the instructor's consent. So um, again, this phrase, we're not going to um, treat it as such because this is already a pre-recording, but if you would like um, permission to actually share it with friends or relatives who are actually taking up the uh, same topic, you may do so. Uh, but first, you have to seek uh, permission from me. So if you let me know, I can definitely um, send you back an email giving you a written consent so we are all protected. A description of the applicable procedures is provided online in the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. Thank you for your cooperation. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the handbook is always available at the PGCPS portal. Uh, but if you don't want to actually um, navigate the portal, you can, of course, um, just try and go to the Google Classroom and then scroll all the way, all the way down to my uh, earlier posts because I definitely put up a link that brings you straight to the handbook from there. Okay, now that, uh, now that this is out of the way, let us now begin with our lesson for the week, which is probability. Okay, here we go, people. All right, so introduction to probability. So we'll start off with something easy, like what we did with counting, if you could call that easy. So the um, lesson objectives is that um, students are expected to define probability and apply its definition. And then I think the hard part for this one is to solve word problems which use or which asks about probability, including the use of Venn diagrams. So we will encounter a particular problem here where definition will not be sufficient. We might have to use Venn diagrams in order to clarify things. All right, so the definition of probability. So probability is defined as the ratio of favorable outcomes to all possible outcomes. When you talk about probability, it's always going to be a ratio. It's always going to be smaller than one because definitely you have less favorable outcomes to, as compared to all possible outcomes. Probability then, of a particular event A is computed as the number of ways event A can happen divided by the total number of possible outcomes. And note, of course, that the number of total possible outcomes definitely is more than the number of ways that the desired event A will happen. Okay, so I think there's an example here. Okay, so the example is quite easy. On rolling uh, two six-sided dice, what is the probability that the outcomes of the two dice, A, are both odd numbers, and letter B will have sum of six? All right, so if you would like to actually try this out on your own and you need more time, you may pause the video 
solve it by yourself and then unpause the video so that you can actually see the solution and check whether your answers are correct or not. Right, I think um, that's enough time for you to have paused and unpaused the video. So let's try to go over now the um, answers for this particular questions. So we'll start off with letter A, right? So if you roll a six-sided dice, so this is the common dice, right? It's six faces, it's like a cube. Right. Usually the numbers you see there on the faces are from one to six. So they're either inscribed there in terms of dots or actual numbers. But regardless, those are the dice that we are talking about. So what is the probability that the outcomes of the two dice are both on numbers? Now, let's go to our uh, whiteboard so we can actually... Right, so we can actually um, try to write it down. So we are looking for uh, the number of ways that the outcomes both come out as odd numbers. Now odd numbers, because the, the possible outcomes for each die is from one all the way to six. Therefore, from this one, you actually have three odd numbers. One, three, and five. Three possible outcomes. Therefore, if you have two dice, the total number of possible outcomes would be any three from the first die and any three from the second die. So therefore, the total number of possible outcomes where both outcomes uh, were both die or both dice roll up as an odd number would just be three times three, which is simply nine. All right. So this would be our numerator. All right. So therefore the numerator is nine over. So the question is what are the number of possible outcomes? Again, each die has sent a possible outcome from one to six. So that is pretty much six outcomes. So is the second die. Therefore, the total possible outcomes for both dice would just be 6 times 6, which is 36. All right. So therefore, the probability that both come out as odd numbers would be 9 over 36. Or if you reduce that, that is 1 fourth. If you are more comfortable with decimals, that can be expressed as 0.25 or... 25% if you feel more of the percentage. All right, so it's not a decent, uh, it's not a bad chance, yeah? 25%. Okay, I mean, it's, it's below 50, yes, so it's not a very good one, but I think it's quite decent. Um, the next question is, what is the probability that the outcome all right, the outcomes of the two dice would have a sum which is about six. All right, so let's erase this one. So the, um, the outcome for dice one plus the outcome for dice two should be equal to six. So let's try to write down the possibilities for this one. Okay, so obviously uh, dice one cannot turn out a six because dice two doesn't have a zero. So therefore, I think the lowest possible outcome for dice one would be one. Whereas, whereas for dice two, that would be a five. So as to guarantee that the outcome will turn out to be a six, or with the sum will turn out to be a six. Next, will we have a two, then a four. Next, we have a three and a three. And then on the next two options, this two, outcomes will just interchange per dice. So instead of dice one rolling a one, uh, instead of dice one rolling a two, it could roll out a four, then dice two could be the two, dice one could be the five, and dice two could be the one. So in all these combinations, all right, the sum of the two comes out to be six. All right, so how many possible combinations do we have? So we have one here, another one here, third, 
fourth, and fifth. So there are five possible ways for us to get our desired result. Okay, so <clears throat> it's five ways out of how many possible outcomes as uh, computed earlier. There are 36 possible outcomes in rolling a six-sided dice twice or enrolling two six-sided dice. All right, so it's five out of 36. So how much is that in uh, percent or in, um, yeah, because five over 36 is a fraction in lowest terms. So let's just try to compute for how much that is as a decimal. Ha! It's about 14 percent. Uh, it's about 0.14, approximately 0.14. Or if you would like percent, it's about 14%. All right. So this one definitely a much less chance compared to the previous one. Okay. So let's go check. All right. So we have, okay, for the first one. Both coming as odd numbers. We have the one fourth, 0.25, or 25% answer. And then for the second one, we have 5 over 36, or about 0.14 or 14%. Okay, so that definitely checks out for the first example. Okay, next, the sum of all probabilities. The sum of all probabilities for all possible outcomes for a particular event is equal to 1. Right, so if you have a, an event wherein three possible things could happen, let's say it's like a jar wherein you draw one ball, and um, inside the jar you actually have red balls, blue balls, and yellow balls. All right, so therefore, if you're only drawing one ball from the jar, then that ball could be a red, a blue, or a yellow. So there are three possible outcomes. <clears throat> okay, all right. so the number, all right, and uh, the, the sum of probabilities, right, for all three possible outcomes should be equal to one. That means the probability you draw a red plus the probability you draw a blue plus the probability you draw a yellow should all be equal to one. I mean, uh, if they, they should all add up to one, all right, you cannot. You cannot, it cannot be smaller than one because that means you're missing a particular outcome. It cannot exceed one, right? Because that means that you actually have put in more possible outcomes instead of the real total possible outcomes. Okay, now um, this knowledge is actually very, very important because sometimes we are confronted with a binary situation. So a binary situation is it's like a two situation, right? So it's either you get what you want or you don't get what you want. Easy enough to like consider. So in a binary situation, the probability of a particular event not happening, denoted by P A prime or A apostrophe, but it's read as A prime or sometimes you can read it as A complement, is equal to one minus probability of A happening. So if you want to figure out how many ways A cannot happen, you just simply subtract the probability A happens from one, and you get all the possible outcomes that A does not happen. So this might seem counterintuitive, but it's definitely important for us to emphasize. So make sure that you do remember that if you are looking for a complement probability, it is simply one minus the probability of a particular event um, happening. So if you're looking for how many way, uh, what's the probability of something not happening? That's simply one minus the probability it happens. Okay? All right, so let's see a particular example wherein using this one is actually helpful. Okay, all right, so the next example. Suppose a fair coin, okay, so in this particular problem, we're going to assume that um, every, um, everything is 
a fair object except when it has to be emphasized that it's an unfair object. So suppose a fair coin, which means it's equally likely to turn heads as it does for tails. Okay, so it's not weighted on a particular side. Definitely, if you toss it um, 50 times, half the time it turns heads, half the time it turns tails. Right? So suppose you toss a fair coin five times. Right? What is the probability that at least one head turns up? Okay? So out of those five tosses, you get to have at least one head. What is the probability for that? Okay? So if you would like to try this out on your own, uh, you may, of course, pause the video and then try to answer it. Then once you're done, you can unpause the video and then check your answer. Okay? I think that's um, enough time for you guys to have paused the video. Uh, make a decent attempt. All right? Check your, um, see whether you're sure about your answers and then unpause the video to check whether your answers turned out correct or not. Okay. So, um, to, uh, to solve this problem directly, so if at least one head uh, turns up, then that means the list of possible outcomes you have would be one out of five tosses turns up heads, two out of the five tosses turns out heads, because remember, it's at least one head, right? Next one is at least three, at least four, and finally, the last possible uh, desired outcome is when all of them turns out to be heads. All right. So that's pretty much like five different possible outcomes you're looking into, right? So if you're going to compute for the probability direct, you'll have to compute for each of those, uh, the, the probabilities for each of those possible outcomes and then add them. Because take note, if after five tosses, only one came out heads, you are sure definitely that not two, uh, there were not, there were, um, uh, it was not possible for two heads to come out because only one came out. All right. So the secret here is maybe it might be easier to compute for the probability of this one not happening. So what is the probability that um, at least one head does not turn up? Okay. So if we are to rephrase that, if at least one head does not turn up, then that means all five tosses results as a tails. All right? That's definitely easy. All right? Because, all right? Because if you are going to toss a coin five times, each, uh, each time, each toss has two possible outcomes, heads or tails. So if you're going to do it five times, then there would be two to the fifth number of possible outcomes here or 32 ways okay of possible outcomes of heads or tails right or any combinations of those all right but the only way that all five in all five tosses they all come out as tails is just one way right the first coin has to come out tails the second one tails the third tails fourth tails fifth tails there's only one possible way for them to all turn out as tails. All right? So therefore, that is 1 out of 32. All right? So the probability of getting all tails is 1 out of 32. This is the complement. This is the opposite. Therefore, the probability of getting, of getting, head, of getting at least one head, all right, would simply be the difference of one minus the probability of getting no heads. All right, so therefore the probability of at least getting one head is one minus one over 32 or 31 over 32. Now 31 over 32 simply converts to 0.97 or about 97%. All right, so it's a very, very big chance, which is, uh, logical. I mean, only one out of 32 will definitely make it um, false or only one out of 32 possible ways 
will it be rejected? All right. Okay. So I think the last example uh, might be the uh, most um, complex out of this particular examples because that particular example may use Venn diagrams. All right. So let's look at this example. All right. So we have 100 high school students, right? And they were surveyed about which club or clubs they belonged in. According to the tally, all right, so 31 students are members of the English club. 35 students belong to the science club. 30 students are members of the math club. 13 are members of both English and science clubs. 10 would be members of both English and math. 11 are members of both science and math. And three are members of all three clubs. So take note, for the 100 students, these are the number of um, tallies they had for how many students belong to each club. What is the probability of selecting a student among the respondents who is not a member of any club? So we're looking for someone or how many of the 100 do not belong to any club at all. All right. So if you would like to make an attempt uh, for this one, uh, you may do so. You are encouraged to do so. You may um, pause the video. Right, make a decent attempt, and then when you're ready to check your answer or uh, see the solution, you may unpause the video and then we can see them. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, that's enough time for us to actually um, have a, uh, for you guys to actually try it, uh, pause and unpause the video if you have tried it. So now we're going to go over the um, solution for this one. All right. So for this one, all right, we're going to bring out our, um, whiteboard aha all right so in this particular case all right uh we're going to oh wait actually before we go there i think it's it's better if we actually uh see why we have to use a venn diagram all right oops Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, we have 100 students in total, right? Nothing more. Okay, if you look at the numbers, 31 plus 35 plus 30 plus 13 plus 10 plus 11 plus 3. So if you add all these numbers, notice it actually will go beyond 100. I mean, even if this 3... We're just 30, 30 students, 30 students, 30 students. And then you have 10 here. That's already 100. So how much more are these extra students down here? Okay, so for this particular problem, I think we can assume that some students are actually members of multiple clubs. So in such a case, the best approach is to actually use Venn diagrams. All right, so for a Venn diagram to work, okay, for a Venn diagram to work, all right, so we need to draw three circles. Usually that's the Venn diagram, all right. So each circle talks about a particular set. All right, so this first circle here is, of course, the English Venn diagram, all right. This one right here is the science set and then finally we have the math set here all right now the importance of understanding this uh, venn diagram is to look at 
what numbers go to uh, go to each one All right so let's look at dimensions All right. so this particular dimension here all right this is the part wherein the student all right or students belong to all three clubs all right so they they all belong to english science and math all right so that's how you would understand what that particular area is <coughs> this particular area here all right so notice notice the part this area here means these are the students all right who only belong to math club oops okay so this area here right represents the number of students who only belong to math club they, they belong they don't belong to english or science as well just math and then finally right the outside space right here outside okay this would refer to the students who belong to no club all right okay so pretty much all the numbers here the ones inside the circles in each particular space all right and then outside that should be the hundred students all right so you should have one number for each space okay and then plus the one outside because it doesn't belong to uh, any club that if you add all those numbers that should be a hundred all right so let's get to it let's try to like see how many students belong to each particular region of our venn diagram okay here we go all right okay so here we go so first we know that three students are members of all three clubs so in the very center of our venn diagram this region right here this region all right bounded by this shape right here there should be three students there right because they are the students who belong to english science and math clubs all right so once you've identified that we are now ready to identify the other spaces over here which are like overlaps of your circle all right so let's go back to the previous one all right so take note uh 13 students belong to both english and science so english and science we have 13 10 belongs to english and math 11 to science and math so 13 10 11 english science science math oh i'm sorry english science english math and science math all right so english and science you should have 13 students in total to be together now take note because you have three students which belong to the math club therefore 13 minus 10 all right i mean 13 minus three gives you 10 students that means 10 students are only members of english ed science club okay because the three three of them three out of the 13 belongs to the math club as well so only 10 of them belong exclusively to english and science so if you repeat the process for both science and math and english and math you would get this particular numbers the seven and the eight all right so now we have figured out you know how much students belong to each particular space all right now that we have identified how many students actually belong to multiple clubs we are now ready to identify how many students belong exclusively to one club all right so take note 
31 students are members of the English club. Okay? That means this whole circle here, which is for English students, this one should have a total of 31. So we already have 10, 3, and 7 here, which totals 20. Therefore, out of the 31 students, was it 31? Yes, it was 31. So out of the 31 students, who belong to the English club, 11 of them actually belong to just English club. There we go. 11. All right? And then you repeat the process for science. So for science, you have 13, uh, I mean 35 students who belong to science. All right? But there's uh, 10, 3, and 8 who belongs to other clubs. So you subtract those numbers. You have 14, which are only science club members. All right, math? Same process, you have 30 students who belong to math. So you subtract 7, 3, and 8. You compute for how many students belong to just the math club. Now, once this is all broken down, right, you are now ready to identify how many students do not belong to any club at all. So what you do is simply, uh, is simply 100 minus all these numbers. So 100 minus all those numbers, you get 35. So there is 35 students who belong to none of the clubs presented here. So therefore, the probability that a student does not belong to the club out of those respondents is 35 out of 100, which is also 0.35 or 35%. By the way, 35 over 100, when reduced to lowest terms, is 7 out of 20. And that is, of course, an acceptable answer. Right? So I hope you actually uh, learned um, something new for this week. Or if you already learned this, I hope it has refreshed your mind and um, that there, will no, there were no um, misconceptions. Or if there were, they were corrected after this um, lesson. So um, I hope you guys are keeping safe. All right? So um, keep safe. And... Um, Seniors, I guess congratulations. This will be your last week, right? For the non-seniors, I guess I'll be seeing you for the next few weeks. So that's all for this week, people. Bye.